This is Mini Geology Radio Program. Daniel Benzini is speaking, your inquisitive geologist. Today we are going to meet and uh, interview Scott Tinker, probably the most interviewed geologist in the world. Let's go and see if we make it on time. Like our dear friend Ray Hill, founder of KPFT, says 90% of radio is showing up. So let's see if we make it and meet our dear friend Scott Tinker, downtown Houston, flowing now in the veins of this megalopoly to reach his hotel. Okay. Scott Tinker is here, <laughs> finally, we got it, we're in time, you know that in radio, uh, you say 90% of radio is showing up. Yeah. <laughs> so we're good. Yeah. We're very good. Good. You are here. Good. Um, Scott, I read in here, protagonist of an important project, or at least two, that we want to talk about it today, switch and switch on. And so the mission, if I could uh, synthesize that and summarize, is inspire the public to learn about energy, uh, to engage in form conversation, and to make smart decisions on global energy future. Mm -hmm. What are the conclusions of these projects of yours? <laughs> well, I'm not sure we have conclusions, but we certainly... Uh have been doing a lot of neat things along the way. And one of the big conclusions, I think, if we have such, is that it's needed. Because the more people I meet and get all over the world, the, the more I realize that people's energy education levels vary. And all of us need to raise our levels of education. So, you know, switch and the switch energy projects and the switch energy alliance, that's what we're trying to do. Is get good, objective, film-based, so you can digest it quickly and see it. Why do, do, do you say that you don't have many conclusions? Well, I'm always learning. <laughs> so It's like so. writing a paper, maybe. At some point, you have to decide when it's time to write, and you have to write well, your we, conclusions. We make films, and we, make, we put films out. We have over 299 short format videos on the website, so those those go and we look back at some of them and say well that's kind of dated you need to update that but I think in the bigger sense we're all always students and so we're learning uh, learning as we go and continue to evolve and learn and that makes it exciting I, I really like to emphasize the importance of these projects because you're reaching out which is something that I'm passionate about because I'm also trying to reach out. Right. So today I would like to talk with you about why you do it and how you do it so that we can learn from you and try to replicate or integrate. Mm -hmm. So I would like to start from the why. What is that moved you uh, to do this project? Was something gradual or was it... Uh, the so-called uh, uh, moment. <laughs> <laughs> it was a switch. Yeah, it might have been both. I've, I've been in the energy business my whole career and was born into it. So there's the gradual piece, and I speak a lot. And I enjoy that. I gave a talk yesterday at Shell and today here at the Super Basins, and I'll speak tomorrow at PGS. So different audiences, different groups. But you can only reach so many people one-on-one, -on -one, very powerful, and I love that. But along the way, then other documentary films started to come out about different aspects of energy. Some were okay, and some were less than okay. I think they had... Uh, sometimes filmmakers can have an opinion, and then they film some things to share their opinion. And I'm not sure that's really a documentary. It's more like an op-ed. It's filmed. <laughs> and So was there any... Uh, particular uh, movie several the, the, yeah. so, so in which years yeah. the, 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 this is the, seven eight years ago you know that things started okay. to come out and sway public opinion about different kinds of energy and and the whole dialogue about climate change which is important and more recently and I think we're helping to bring that to light the poverty issue and energy poverty those in the world that don't have any energy or very little how those can play together 
So the medium to communicate with young people is, and, and all people, but particularly younger people, is film. Uh, you know, YouTube and short, punchy, fact-based, smart. They, they get it. You know, they know if you're if they're seeing something that's not real or. You know, but but uh, we decided to go down that road. And also you can reach a much broader global audience. So Switch is in over 50 countries now. We've passed 15 million viewers, which is a remarkable achievement. And thousands of universities where faculty are now using it to start classes in policy and business and science. And so in a way you say that it was a, a gradual understanding of uh, this mission that you have because of your... Um, you were embedded in a family of geologists, <laughs> and and then it was like a, a click, a switch when you start watching all of these movies. Yeah, that you decide. And, yeah, and, well, and some of them I think were yeah. misleading, to be honest. But you're a geologist. Yeah. Uh, you are the Bureau of Economic Geology. What is your relationship with films and movies? How did you find this link? Oh, just lucky. <laughs> I was, I was actually being interviewed for another documentary by a documentary filmmaker named Harry Lynch. And afterwards, he asked me if I'd ever written a book. He said he'd read some of my stuff, and the interview went fun. It was fine. And I said, nah, too lazy. <laughs> he said, you want to make a movie? <laughs> so, so that's the conversation, literally, that happened when we were interviewing for his other film. And we talked about that. I said, what would it cost to make a movie in different levels of funding for a great movie? all film around the world and we got together as a partner partnership co-produced switch and i was the on-screen guide and he i'm the pretty face and he's the brains <laughs> but it's been a great okay. marriage ever since that time he's done other films on mental health and other things won some emmy awards when did you start the collaboration 2009 10 years ago yeah so the why you do it is uh, to educate on energy is to find out the relationship uh, between energy and poverty and uh, maybe also sometimes you mentioned the misconception of the oil and gas industry yeah is that right and all the energy industries so but energy and poverty and the environment i think those are my passions energy the economy and the environment and poverty is part of the economy climate change is part of the environment there are other parts as well land and water So bringing those together is is critical. I've got four kids, and, and we all hope to leave the world a little better than we entered it. And I truly think energy is one of the vital issues of our time, both a positive and also uh, not without challenges and costs. So if we can help in some way to advance the understanding of that, the pros and the cons of all forms of energy, And all forms of energy have pros and cons. Right now the dialogue is sort of, there's some bad energy over here, it's called fossil energy and nuclear. And there's good energy, solar and wind and all these clean things. And that's just a construct of those who wish to propagate who, who, who are those? Well, it's political in part. You know, there's definitely, if you like old industrial fossil energy, you tend to vote to the right. And if you like new clean green energy, you tend to vote to the left. So there's political components. Um, there are those who have been educated in, in more science and technology fields and, and, and I think understand the pros and cons and challenges of, of industry at scale. Um, the, the thought of simple wind turbines and solar collectors is, a, is an elegant one and it's very enamoring. But if you start to think about what it takes to do that at scale for seven or eight billion people, then it becomes a massive industrial process as well. And why do I say that? How do I manufacture giant wind turbines? Because it's low density energy. The wind is very low density and so is the sun as compared to liquids and gas or radioactive elements. So you need a lot of collectors. But to get that, you mine and you manufacture and then you transport and transmit and, and then you dispose. So you imply that um The perception, the general perception in the public is that uh, this uh, solar and wind energy mm. is uh, positive or good, as you said, quote yeah. unquote. Green. Green, mm -hmm. but um, there's no uh, public debate about 
the, these uh, environmental uh, challenges. Environmental and, challenges. And, and certainly on an emission sense it is at the site, at the source, much greener, if you will, lower emissions, if any, you have to manufacture, but that's a small part. On the other hand, the land use and the mining and the disposal and the water that goes into those things, mining rare earth elements and metals and copper and chemicals and things for batteries, it, it's non-trivial when you go to scale. Okay, so that's, I think we, it's hard for any of us to wrap our heads around what a hundred trillion cubic feet of gas is or or uh, you know 90 to 100 billion barrels of oil or or you know 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy consumption in the US alone 400 quads globally or more these are numbers that who, who, you can't process who should, who should teach these things to the public well we hope everyone should you know, that, that has some knowledge of it and that's what we're trying to do in switch we related in the film switch we related energy to how much a, a individual consumes each year and then we measured everything in the human unit right one one human year yeah but is this something that should be taught at school at elementary school oh, sure. or middle school it or? sure it should and it unfortunately it is but again in ways that kind of tend to paint things good and bad uh, and that then brings biases to kids pretty early on and they have to have these realizations then about the scale and the challenges of all that so the you know the the idea behind switch and just education in general that I'm passionate about is is to try to get objective balanced materials into the hands of everyone they're free on the website and I encourage people to use them to fact check them to find other sources but to ask them, to motivate them to start to ask their own questions and dive into it a little bit more and get excited about this wonderful world of energy that we all benefit so much from. It's, we don't even know all the components in our lives. We really don't know. There's nothing, we're sitting right here, there's nothing. We're three floors off the ground, metal, glass, carpet, and wood. All that comes from energy. We're wearing clothes, energy. We just ate. We're having a drink, energy. There's nothing unrelated to energy. Nothing. Nothing in the modern world. Now, I was down in Colombia a couple months ago with Switch. And we brought first electricity to the indigenous village of Unchuqua in the Sierra Nevada on the northeast Colombia Venezuelan border. And I have to say that we have this uh, serendipity moment where we met uh, at the airport. We did. <laughs> we did. And we were headed to <laughs> Colombia and you were coming. Yeah, to Argentina. It was, it was great. Um, but the Awako Indians, the, the native indigenous folks, have lived in those mountains for 500 years, essentially the same. Now, they're aware of the modern world, and they go into it, but their lifestyle, the mud huts, the thatch roofs, um, the handmade clothing, the foods, the size of the people, much smaller. Their um, life expectancy, much shorter. Still having 10 to 15 children, because half of them die. So we walked back 500 years into the 15th century in the world today and they had agreed to let us bring first solar first electricity which was solar just a three kilowatt array is half of what you would put on your house in the u.s for seven village uh, buildings did they, did they want solar also because also they were biased they want solar because the, they have a river running through but it, the waters are sacred the wind resources more limited because they're in forested area and mountains and they didn't want to hook into the grid because that represented a different um, part of society. Oh really, is it cultural thing? It's cultural. It's cultural. Very so they, interesting. Very, and they accepted solar and that meant we put LED lights in seven buildings, three ceiling fans, one refrigerator freezer for vaccines and some treats, cold treats. And that night when we turned on the switch for the first time ever at night, Gunchukwa could be seen from a satellite. And it wasn't without some moral uh, conflict. You know, we know the potential of the modern world and not everybody's content and happy. But on the other hand, when I saw young kids there who we got to know very well over the course of eight days, we played football with them. We taught them how to throw a U.S. football. We went swimming and things. That 
could die of a toothache. Right. And we're hungry. No, I'm not, not starving, but always hungry. Then morally I said, this, this is good. This, this is what they want and we want. We filmed it. It'll be part of the film switch on. And, and there are between 800 million and a billion people in the world today that live like that. That's more than two United States with nothing in terms of energy. And another billion or more that live with very little energy because they either have access and can't afford it or they don't have much access. And when you start to think about those numbers, I think that that is it's just wrong. In, in, in a modern world, if we truly believe in the philosophy of equality and, and equity, um, which is impossible, but at least providing the context around which people can have a chance for that, then we have to be able to get energy to the world. And it's not easy. I said that we met uh, and, and, and there was a, a thought that came to my mind by serendipity meeting you, uh, which was uh, the topic of population growth. Yes. And uh, this is also a topic that is not in the public arena. And uh, do you want to comment on this? What are your thoughts on population growth? Because uh, uh, the more the people, the more the energy needed. And the people is the driver for the energy right. need. So why don't fo focus, or why nobody focus, apparently, mm. nobody focus on the root of the issue? Yeah, yeah. I showed two population graphs in my talk this morning, and I almost always do if I have any time at all, and talk about population because people consume energy. So there's very little doubt. And it's a chicken and egg. Which came first, the energy or the growth? Because the world was living in parity for a long time. But as, as access to energy and then agriculture, those are the two big drivers, and fresh water came along. It allowed us to grow at a rate faster than sustenance because we could, we could produce food in denser ways that could feed more than just ourselves. And that allowed populations surplus. to start to grow with a surplus. Energy the same. And energy does work for us while we then can go do other things. Um, so energy fed growth, growth feeds energy, and, and it's a non-virtuous circle. Um, certainly, if you look at the data today, and I love data, If you look at where the population growth is flat or declining, it's in the developed nations. Western Europe, the US, uh, at some level Australia, uh, where you see uh, a level of economic health such that we don't have to have 12 or 15 kids, most have two or fewer. And less than two kids is negative population growth. Education comes along with energy and developed world. So as we start to think about how to take that growth over and roll it over, given what we're starting with, we have to educate, we have to provide energy, we have to get the world to where it doesn't need to continue to expand the population in order just to survive. The largest growth rates today are in Asia and Africa. Africa, the greatest growth rates, a billion people, projected to double to two billion people mid-century. And that gets to be unsustainable. And so I, underst I understand there's an elegant theory in here which instead of asking populations not to breathe and have more kids, <laughs> instead of saying to stop having kids, mm -hmm. You say we provide energy, the energy is going to enhance their quality of life, the quality and of education. life and education. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, because we study history and we see what happened, then they're going to decrease the number of kids that they have. You don't need to have as many kids in order to survive and be healthy and thrive. And that happened in this country. There, you know, the families were much bigger a century ago in the U.S. too. Farming, agriculture, uh, ranching and light industry that was developing in the 1800s. There are bigger families here. Um, now, not. The only reason population grows a little bit in the U.S. is because we import 
people. <laughs> and same with Western Europe. There's migration that goes on from countries where there isn't opportunity or hope, undeveloped, underdeveloped, and they come to areas where they perceive there is, and that's the developed world. So, again, the data are pretty clear on that. Um, the moral case I won't get into, that tends to cross over into a variety of theological and, and ethical conversations about that. And, and you know, everybody has their own take on that, but um, when you look at countries that are not growing, they have multiple different religions in them and philosophical beliefs, so it, it, the data show that that works. Okay. Most of the forecasts show population global capping around 10 to 11 billion people in the mid to late 21st century and then starting to roll over. It's going to be interesting when that happens. There's a lot of it's, things. It's uh, uh, interesting that you mention politics, ethics, culture, and religion like being the predisposing factors for the this trigger, the population growth. Right. Right. They're, they are all woven into it, as is economics. And I think, I think if you start to think about education and economics, what drives economies, um, the fact that we have leisure time here, you and I can sit and visit for an hour because we don't have to be out in the fields right now. We, we have other things doing work for us. That are, and that work is provided in part by technology and energy. So as that happens in the world, population tends to grow, or, or um, slow in its growth and roll over. And that's where I would, that's how I would look at that, and that's how I do look at that, is getting access, bringing undeveloped nations out of poverty, getting the education and the better agriculture and food and clean water, um, equality for women and and really starting to to provide a, a lifestyle that is more part of this modern world and energy is a big piece of that yeah, I admire that you have a moral imperative uh, to uh, use your leisure time uh, mm -hmm. in this topic because yeah. nobody seems that is forcing you to go into that direction right no <laughs> No, I'm, you confirm? Yeah, it's it's true. I uh, I don't sit around too much, but you know it, it it's okay. Uh, Another fun kind of fun project along these lines, but a little different. I don't remember if we've talked about this about a just not quite a year ago along the lines of education. Earth date? Yes. Yeah. Have I told you? Well, of course, we dedicate a full uh, uh, oh, right. episode to Earth, right. uh, Earth right. Dates, good. and we give these little pills to our audience yeah. of two minutes, a blue pill of two minutes, a blue pill of uh, <laughs> a red pill of two minutes to grow and, and shrink uh, and, to and talking from right. the guttural sounds of the dinos dinosaurs yeah, yeah. to the tens of minerals or hundreds of minerals that are in the iPhone. Yeah, yeah. Of course. And, uh, and uh, we thank you that you put it yeah. up there. Everybody can download or listen to yeah. it. Yeah, the scripts and the research. And yeah. we cont it continues to grow. We're over 300 stations now. Say again, what is the website to... Um, EarthDate.org. Good. EarthDate.org. EarthDate. Why EarthDate? Well, um, no good idea goes unstolen. <laughs> and, and there's a great program on NPR stations called Stardate. And it comes from the McDonald Observatory, and it's on each evening, and Sandy Wood reads it in Wonderlog. This is Stardate, and I listen to it every night, and I'm thinking, that's neat stuff. You know, it's this, it's the universe. I think, but we need an Earth date, uh, a date yeah, with yeah. Earth. So let's bring it down here and look at all the different things that go on related to not just geosciences, but all the things that happen on Earth scientifically and, and that's a lot of fun so we've passed 300 stations in less than a year all 50 states several countries now Slumberjay has just decided to sponsor Earth Day and we thank Slumberjay for that because they see the global impact so these are the kinds of things that if you can get into the cars 
and onto the YouTubes and into the handheld devices and the classrooms with video and yeah. audio, short, punchy. People just hear it and they think and it triggers them to go investigate and excites something in them. Then so, that's Scott, awesome. I see that your, your um, thought has evolved since uh, seven, eight years ago when you started this project. Yeah. Do you, can you tell us the evolution of your film? How was it when you started this project? How is it today? What did change? Or what sure. You never know how something's going to go, right? I knew Harry was a great filmmaker. And if I could raise some money, <laughs> we'd probably do something good. And I think we did with Switch. Uh, and we didn't know, though, that it would continue to be popular. We knew we were going to make it objective and balanced and as honest as we could make it, looking at the pros and cons of each issue. Because of that, it has stood the test of time. There are some things that are a little out of date, as with all things, as, as almost a decade goes by. But it has stood the test of time, so that was unexpected. It continues to get used. And then as I've um, worked around the globe and had the the good luck to travel to almost 60 countries now, all different parts of them. From Still two thirds to go. Really high level to severe poverty, you know, get to see it all. Um, that became more apparent to me that part of the world was benefiting from energy and part of the world wasn't. And part of the world isn't doing, you know, not all good with energy either. We, we still have some moral growth there. But it drove me to think, hey, you know, we've got we've to gotta bring the whole world into this picture. And I hooked up with Harry again and said, let's make another film. You, you are saying that you left behind some part of the globe in, uh, oh, yeah. in the very first movie. Well, three billion people. What, which three billion people? The ones mean? that are impoverished. They have well, very little or no energy. And why at that time you didn't dedicate time to them? There was simply no it space? Was, it was an oversight. Okay. In many ways, we were we filmed in 11 countries. We went to 23 sites. We interviewed 50 people, and we were and talking about energy. Enough. Well, we yeah. we were talking about energy. Energy yeah. was the star of switch. All forms of energy, but what we weren't really thinking is, wait, there's three billion people that don't have much energy. So it wasn't intentional, but switch focused on the developing and developed world of energy, and and now. We have an opportunity to say no. Let's uh, let's grab that other part because they're using they're, they still use energy. They burn dung in huts and they die of lung cancer. They put hay into their vehicles, which are called mules, donkeys, and oxen. That's it's carbon. Dung and wood and hay is all carbon. It hasn't even become dense like coal. Okay, so this is a a carbon-based economy. Make no mistake, three billion people, but they don't use much. Okay, so they they don't have much. It's so low density to do that that uh, the energy themselves. So that's where that's really the motivator for this. And then the, on the much at the other end of the scale completely, climate change, big topic, and and all the politics around that, poverty massive topic, all the politics around that. And energy sits right in there. Okay, So we are fascinated and interested in understanding if these are mutually exclusive or is there some objective function that would let us improve the significantly the carbon emissions by reducing them and other environmental impacts. Improve poverty and other forms of economic destitute with energy. Because right now, fossil fuels is what's lifting the world out of poverty. And the question becomes, do those have to go away or can that still happen? But can they be handled in such a way that the impact on climate and other environmental things is lower? Scott, so we were talking about the evolution of your thought. Right. Uh, was anybody inspirational for you in these years to inspire you? Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, it's interesting. On the energy side, there's a couple of people that I really respect. One is uh, Jesse Osabel. Jesse 
is a brilliant thinker. He's a, a Da Vinci fan. He's at the Rockefeller University in New York City on Manhattan. He's a true environmentalist, but his environmental passion is land. Less, more nature. Less human footprint on nature. He's also, and then he's a Renaissance man. He's the person who coined the term decarbonization. He saw the trend away from carbon to hydrocarbons to hydrogen, and then eventually to non-hydrogen-based fuels. Really impressed by Jesse. Interviewed him. He's not in the film, but he's on our website. Another guy that I really am impressed by in the energy world is Vaclav Smil. And Smil writes about energy density. He really has written books and books on dense energy and how powerful and important it is to keep the footprint small and the impact high. I like, uh, and I'm not doing justice, either one of them. Okay, but. And then along the way, I met Rich Muller, and Rich is in Switch. He uh, wrote the book Physics for Future Presidents and then Energy for Future Presidents. He's out of Berkeley. Really creative and, and fun person. Uh, had a lot of uh, good conversations with him. Another guy I really respect is Steve Coonan. Steve's in Switch as well. He was at Caltech, young, provost, very young, and chief scientist at BP for a little while, then undersecretary of energy in the Obama administration. First term, he's now at New York University, and he's looking at cities and how to how to understand human movement and to in a very um, kind of big data way, in mm-hmm. a, in an analytics way. So, and there are many more. But I, I like people who think deeply about things like that because I'm not a de- you know, they're way smarter than I am, <laughs> and so it makes me it makes me think and process. Um, so Scott, what is your merit in connecting all of these different thoughts and putting them together? Well, I try, but I wouldn't say you know I'm great at it. But I think well, it's you important. certainly have merit in what you're doing. <laughs> well, thank so, you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I tend to, I guess people tell me that I can reduce complex things into simple terms and, and, and make, make people, you know, the people that understand what I'm visiting that aren't experts. And that's because that's the only level I understand it. So it's not hard to do that. But, but in, in trying to bring these in, into ways that are still accurate, but but simple and, and hopefully elegant so that it, when you're a scientist you don't have to make things complex for people to understand them and if we can all understand then we will evolve and improve right and, and that's what my passion is I think is trying to bring things in a way that are digestible film helps to do that I'm just learning about the power of film usually I speak to, uh, to do that there are other people too out there that that have, you know, that historical figures and others that inspire in different ways, just for their willingness to take on topics that are controversial, um, and not be, not shy away from it or be af- afraid to do that. And it's hard these days. It, it, if you venture out into the world of climate change or poverty or population and other things, it you can find yourself. In, in places and at times where people say, you know, you're a denier or you're a believer or you're... And, and that takes a bit of a thick skin. You just have to kind of get past it. But I think most people I visit with really truly are interested in, in elevating their understanding of any topic. And we can all always do that. So, Scott, um, you uh, talking about this last topic, about expressing yeah. himself... Uh, what do you see your role in, in, in here? Do you think that you express yourself as much as you would like, or you need to maintain a, a balanced um, a yeah. message that is not really coincident with you yeah. as a person? <laughs> because right. it's about communication also. It is. Or, or how, how do you see this? This is very important because there's the message that you launch there and what you think. Right, right. Well, I hope that I communicate what I think and, and believe, um, and what the data say. 
there are ways to do that, and there are other ways. You can be pretty controversial. You can be pretty abrupt and in yeah, your face. Yeah, I would it. say you are not. Well, I try, not, are to try not to be. I try not to be. So on occasion, I am. <laughs> so you are trying not to be on purpose. Right. I try not to you be. You think, yeah. Right, because I'm also not... I, I know that I'm not smart enough to understand everything, and so what I feel and know today will evolve and improve and change as I learn more. And if you... If you get right in somebody's face, they're not going to share back with you what they understand. So it's a, it doesn't become a dialogue or an engagement. It becomes a monologue. That's not very satisfying. Um, so I try to do that. I, we try to remain objective and balanced in that. The challenge with taking what you believe too far into advocacy or even beyond that into activism, and we're all entitled to do that. And I want to make that very clear. I don't, I don't say you can't do that. Do that if that's your passion. But as you become an advocate or an activist or beyond, um, you are saying, "Here's what I believe, and I'm going to go actively pursue and 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 sell that." Um, it's hard to remain objective if you've taken a position on something because that's your position and it's harder to change your position once you've become active about it and and I think scientists I love seeing scientists get engaged I think there are risks and not all my scientific colleagues agree with me on this as scientists become activists in losing of objectivity yeah, and that I see it in here in, in, in this country, the coherency is a positive uh, attribute. And whenever you are caught in something in which you are not coherent, mm -hmm. you are kind of put in a negative uh, position, mm -hmm. in, a, in a dark mm -hmm. spot. Yeah. But if you can be always coherent because if you learn new things and you understand that you are wrong, you have to change. Reserve the right to. That's what science is. I reserve the right to change my opinion or what I understand because science marches along. It's, it's never settled in that sense. I mean, yes, we understand evolution. We understand plate tectonics. But we continue to evolve and learn and grow in the depth of our understanding, even of big topics like that, some fundamental things. And so... All the topics we've been talking about here will have that kind of evolutionary and sometimes revolutionary growth to them. And if you get too entrenched in your position, sometimes it's hard to pull yourself out of that and, and evolve and grow. So in our films, in my speaking, the limited writing that I do, I try to, to maintain some sort of an objectivity that people could fact check or look at and say, yeah, I mean, I'd agree with all those conclusions, but I could see where the data come from and why he would form that opinion, and it's well-founded, that kind of thing. You know, I think that's what science needs to try to do. Um, <laughs> Scott, I was mentioning these topics because um, one way to really get uh, solutions to energy poverty climate change, uh, smart decisions on energy, they are made by the policymakers. And so I was thinking, if you ever thought to be part of that intelligentsia of mm -hmm. uh, policymakers. Yeah. Well, I, I've been asked to. I, uh, Mr. Obama asked me to be Assistant Secretary of Energy a couple times in his first administration, and I looked at it. Um, certainly have looked at and been involved with policymakers and regulators with information in, in those rooms and in those conversations. Uh, I might disagree a little bit with your tenant, though. Uh, I think that markets are where changes happen. Policy can influence directionality and accelerate or incentivize, but if it's not adopted at scale, it won't go forward. So you can only incentivize things for so long before markets have to take them up and grow them or they will not survive. And I'm kind of a markets person. I, I, I love the power of markets. I love the power of billions of people thinking about things, even if 
It's only little thoughts, but you put all that together, and markets are remarkably smart. Now, they are slow to adapt sometimes, and sometimes they can be harmed, and so therefore you need regulation and things to, to protect us from ourselves, <laughs> if you will. But certainly, a, at least a balance between policy and markets, and I lean even toward the market side a little bit more that way. And that, you know, that makes me, that confuses people. <laughs> they say, wait a minute, you can't be doing what you're doing and be a capitalist. Yeah, I kind of can because I see the capital markets as what's going to drive forward some of these changes in scale. And scale matters. If we're doing great things but they're only this big, the kinds of changes that need to happen won't happen. They won't be adopted in the marketplace. So governments need to incentivize, they need to help uh, with policy, and then as things start to go, they back out and, and let the the capital markets, economics, and, and the industrial aspects of that take over and drive it forward. Do you have an opinion on uh, what's going to happen with the Paris uh, Agreement uh, after all of the data that you have been seeing lately? Um, where are we going? Yeah. Well, that's a big accord. Um, you know, tackle it at lots of different levels. It, the, the climate models going forward in the, in the most recent IPCC reports are honest. They're, you know, it's a tough modeling problem. The Earth system and the climate system is a tough problem. It's multivariate, nonlinear, very complex. So understanding all those isn't simple, and that's why climate models look different as they go out in the future, but they're all directionally the same. Um, and so with that directionality, more atmospheric emissions of CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases tend to hold heat in the oceans and, and on Earth. The Paris Accords would help if everybody were to adopt them. Uh, it'll be hard for some nations to do that as they industrialize and grow. So they probably won't. The U.S. pulled out of our component of the agreements, but ironically, we're already two-thirds of the way there towards our 2030 goals. And we were already two-thirds of the way there when the accords were written. People don't know that usually. I wrote some op-eds on that. But we've reduced our CO2 emissions 20% in our power fuel sector by growth in renewables since 2005, which was the base year for our clean power plan. That's what we promised from 05 to 20. 30, uh, to reduce 32%. And we've already come down two-thirds. Renewables grew from 8 to 15% in the power sector, not total energy. And natural gas grew from about 16 to almost 34, 35% now as coal reduced. That combination of natural gas and renewables, we've reduced our CO2 emissions faster than any big nation on Earth. And again, nobody knows that. And when I speak with students, they say, no, no, we can't have done that. We pulled out of the accord. Well, we're doing it without carbon policy, if you will. We have other policies. That's the markets, though, right? That was hydraulic fracturing, natural gas. Yeah, I was wondering, gas, which cheap. is the role of the market in the Paris Agreement? Well, it, you know, in the, in the U.S., a lot of independent oil and gas people went out searching for shale gas, starting with George Mitchell way back, successfully, right? Made it cheap, very cheap. Much cheaper than the yeah, rest of the world. Yeah, but they were going, I mean, independently of the Paris Agreement. Oh, they, 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 weren't, <laughs> they, they weren't trying to look at climate no, change thinking, at all. They were trying to make money. I if the market had any proactive role because market. They don't sure. Know. It's called oil and gas markets. That, that was a very active role in producing a product with lower CO2 emissions. It has CO2 when you burn methane, but no SOX, NOx, mercury particulates, unlike coal. So some good there, and making it cheap, replaced coal, and then renewables. And, and so if you start to think about that, could it happen in other places in the world? Yes, it could. Could we begin to go down that same trail to get emissions lower, and then maybe start to capture the CO2 emissions from those natural gas power plants, carbon capture and sequestration? Well, now all of a sudden we're doing things at scale that really work. Uh, 
it might need some carbon price motivation in parts of the world. You can't take one policy and apply it globally. The world doesn't work that way. Governments are different. Political systems, economies are different. China's economy is not driven by the same kind of underpinnings as the U.S. It just isn't our Russia. So we got to let the world do its thing to get towards a broader set of goals. Um, and I think the irony of all of that is the country that's done it fastest and most is the U.S., who, who has pulled out. Pulled out. Um, pretty ironic situation. It's pretty ironic, but there are lessons in that, okay? Because the structure of the Paris Accords, the, the mechanism to implement it, took a political turn. Some, there are some very big um, political levers, philosophical political levers, when you're talking about how to do things. And one of them is taking wealth and redistributing it. That tends to be a left-leaning or sort of progressive approach, and then the right-leaning don't like the wealth redistribution. And Paris said, no, we're going to redistribute wealth. New countries are going to pay for these countries. And, and politically... Is that the way to do that or not? Um, you certainly knew the reaction to it. If, yeah. and, and, it and so you can't say, well, you're bad because you're going to stick with your philosophical and, and political beliefs. No, that's how one group feels. They don't think that works. It's not that they're right or wrong or good or bad. They just don't think that works as opposed to those who do. So when you start taking political, le moving political levers to implement a plan globally, it's going to get resistance. And I think there's other ways to go about Paris than to try to impose that kind of approach to it. At the end of the day, uh, this is something a lot of people probably don't know. If you combine North America and Europe, which is a lot of big economies, our CO2 emissions have been flat for 40 years, almost half a century. They undulate a little bit, but net flat as opposed to the developing nations right back, and those are growing tremendously, particularly in Asia, the undeveloped and early developing, not yet, because they don't produce much energy. But Asia has grown tremendously. So now Asia produces almost half the world's CO2 emissions. Half of the world. Now, is, is it Asia's fault? Are they bad? No. Um, they're making stuff, products, that the world wants to consume, and it's affordable reliable, it's available. So we have to look around the world at where things are being consumed and maybe figure out how to, if we're going to price carbon, price it based on our consumption of stuff. Everybody who consumes helps to pay. In the U.S. we call that sales tax. <laughs> you know, if, if you own a big, you buy something big and expensive, you pay sales tax on it. If you own a big home, you pay property tax. It's more than a smaller home bigger car, you pay fuel costs bigger. And so if you're doing things that consume more products and produce more CO2, everybody pays. And in the end, everybody pays for that anyway. But if you do it with that lever of, of sort of wealth redistribution, then you're going to get the politics. And that, that wasn't a surprise to me that that's causing some angst across the globe. You, are, you, you say again the word politics. Uh, in the end, I think uh, you didn't tell us why you didn't enter into politics. <laughs> uh, I think I can do more out here. I think I have more impact on the areas that I want to have impact than if I was constrained by the political world. Mr. Perry, Secretary of Energy, but he works for his boss, the president. And, and, and they're both constrained by their voter base. So I actually think, and, and look, and it was Mr. Obama and Mr. Money, Dr. Money, he's before, and Dr. Chu, you know, I, it doesn't matter who's in. They're constrained by their political voter bases and they have to listen to them because that's how they stay elected. I think I have more freedom out here to go down the pathways that I'm interested in, which are kind of the objective, hopefully um, balanced approaches regardless of my political underpinnings. And that tends to 
reach a lot of people and be satisfying to me personally and I think in some ways more powerful as a longer tail on it, a bigger impact. When you can start to reach 10 or 15 million people with Switch and hopefully way beyond that now with some of the approaches we're going to take on the website to in social media to distribute information, you know, it's fun. It, uh, well, I really think that you can um, uh, reach out with your topics to the general public, especially maybe through universities, as you are director of the BEG mm -hmm. and professor, because uh, teaching to to the, to the young generation, mm -hmm. we're going to tell them how different is the mindset of a geologist. Mm -hmm. uh, how geologists they understand the intricacy of the natural systems, right. how they deal with lack of data, how they have to accept that there is no a, 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 a result that is robust, but you have to deal with, right. that you have to listen to many different disciplines in order to integrate. Yes. So if we could uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. teach the people about our mindset, that would be great. And if somebody with that is learning this mindset becomes president, oh, that would <laughs> we're gonna have the world spinning in a completely different, in a completely different uh, direction. Yeah, well, so, we can uh, hope that that's that happens. Yeah, so. a geologist for president. <laughs> There's a geologist governor in Colorado, John Hickenlooper, he's a friend. Um, but uh, yeah, it. It'd be interesting to see, even if that happened, the constraints of that office. And in many big countries, you're, you're kind of bound by your constituency, unfortunately. Um, I don't know. I have to research if we have ever had a geologist as president in any uh, country in the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, Colin Powell is a geologist. He was Secretary of State. Very close. <laughs> <clears throat> and there was one way back. Who was it? Yeah, one of the older presidents. And, uh, I'll be wrong if I say I'm, I want to say Grover Cleveland, but I don't think that was. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Who has actually studied geology? But, but uh, well, you know, geologists wanna... are problem solvers. You know, yes. You have to. You have to, as you say, deal with limited data, um, time series data, multi-faceted, multivariate data and try to come to some set of reasonable conclusions. But on the other hand, some scientists think we're not too rigorous because we have well, so that, many possibilities. That, <laughs> that, that is an interesting philosophical uh, issue, and we're going to tackle that in one of these other I mean, geology shows Good. because uh, it is very important. It, uh, we think, it seems that the geologists, they are... Uh, sounds of a minor god for some reason because uh, it seems that somebody said that science is not rigorous as uh, physicists uh, do or, right. or, or chemists, uh, which is true, but it's a completely different approach. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. It's, it's uh, different. It's uh, becoming more quantified. Uh, yeah, but we still have the heart of the intelligence of the naturalistic, right. of the nat naturalist. Right. Naturalists. Right. right. <laughs> Okay, so um, Scott, do you want to say something to the audience? Do you want to say hello and goodbye and maybe inspire some of the students that are listening and uh, anything specific before uh, saying goodbye? I know. Well, thank you for what you do. This is great. You know, I think that, that uh, you've been at this six, seven years now and your passion is obvious. And I hope I can help you to get big audiences with it. And all the young folks out there, you know, keep it up. Don't quit asking questions. Don't be shy about challenging the common thought because all great inventions happen when something outside of what you believe or think you know is challenged and, and that's when neat things happen. So keep questioning and uh, we'll all have fun. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Scott. Good. This was Mini Geology Show at KPFT Radio HD3 Channel in Houston, Texas. <laughs>